First, I'd like to uh, talk a little bit about SABA. Um, in case of you, I think almost all of you are members, but if you're not, please consider joining our group. We uh, support history in the southern part of the Monterey County, and we try to <coughs> educate and uh, inform about the historical aspects of Monterey County, and, or at least the southern part of Monterey County. And we appreciate all the support we can get, so please consider doing that for us. Um, and, uh, so welcome everyone. I'm going to turn it over to Ms. Karen, who is the program chairman for today, and she will take care of the rest of the program. Thank you. Here's Ms. Karen. Karen Jernigan, the program chairperson for the San Antonio Valley Historical Association event. And I'm pleased to see all of you who have come to listen to the story of the amazing diary that documents the life of Lilla Pearl Wrist Daniels. Today we are going to hear from Pearl's children. Her second son, Marvin Daniels, from Pismo Beach, who has been transcribing the diary. Her oldest son, Danny, who lives in King City, and daughter, Marlene, who lives in Parkfield. A couple years ago, my husband, John, and I were at a funeral at Eddington's funeral service, and we ran into Bill and Robin Rist. Knowing that we were interested in the history of the area, they mentioned to us that every morning they were getting text messages from a week in the life of Bill's relative, Pearl Rist Daniels. For 64 years, Pearl, each night, wrote a couple sentences about what happened in her life. Bill suggested we contact Marvin if we were interested. Since then, we have been receiving these entries every morning. And to our delight, we recognized many of the names of King City businesses, area residents, and local and national events that affected her life. Because John's family attended the Community Baptist Church in King City with Pearl and her family, sure enough, there appeared the Jernigan name in the diary. The San Antonio Valley Historical Association is dedicated to preserving the stories and images of Southern Monterey County. So it is with delight that today we welcome Marvin, Danny, and Marlene to speak to you. This program will be recorded with plans to be published on the San Antonio Valley Historical Association YouTube channel. For that reason, we ask our audience to be as quiet as possible so that we can get a quality recording. And please, silence your cell phones. We expect this presentation to last about an hour. If there is time at the end, we will entertain questions. If we run out of time, our guest speakers have offered to stay after to talk. So, please welcome our first speaker, Marvin Dennis. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm uh, Marvin Daniels, living in Pismo Beach, and I'm happy to be here today with my son, Marvin Lee, from Fresno, to tell you part of the story about the diaries of my mother, Pearl Risk Daniels. First of all, here is a photo of my mother. Uh, Pearl Rist in 1935, just before she started writing in the diary on January 1st, 1937. She was a 1931 graduate, King City High School, and wrote a few sentences in her diary every night for 64 years. Here's a photo of my grandparents Benjamin and Virginia Rist in front of Ben and Virgie's parents' uh, home. 
Henry and Ella Rist at the northwest corner of Lynn Street and North Ross Avenue. Uh, Virginia gave Pearl a, a, a first diary for Christmas in 1936. Here's a portion, uh, a photo of Pearl on her wedding day of 1937. And here's a couple of photos of me as a young person. My enthusiasm searching genealogy in the 1980s brought me to ask my mother questions about extended family. Her diary helped her remember more information than I asked, which was great. In 1987, we started the Risk Family Reunion that met at King City Park and later at San Lorenzo Regional Park. The diary helped us to know who to invite. Mom wrote letters to nearly everybody on the in the universe. <laughs> Back in August of 2001, my mom was writing, no, visiting my mom, my wife Petronella and me. She loved clam chowder, so we went to Oceano for clam chowder. While eating, I asked if she would will the diaries to me so I could look up more information on genealogy. And in a voice, I had never heard before, she said, the diaries are personal, and I'm going to burn them when I get home. <laughs> the last day she wrote in the diary was Tuesday, August the 7th, 2001, and she wrote, baked chiffon cake for lodge and had ice cream for dessert. But she didn't burn the diaries. Soon after mom passed, I gathered the 13 diaries. Nearly every diary has a note paper between the pages with added information, especially at the end of the, end of the diary section, and they're in five years at a time. So anyway, um, I lost my place now. Marvin, should I, I turn that light I back on? I debated for 15 years if I should share the diary text. My siblings were okay with it, so I felt strongly that the information was historic and educational. During that time, Somebody asked me about Bitterwater 4-H history, so they knew it was in the diary, and that got me interested in starting the diary text. On Thanksgiving weekend, 2019, I began experimenting with sending text one day at a time until my nephew, Evan Daniel, said, I'm not even going to be born for X amount of years. <laughs> Send more. Send more at a time so that I can... Uh, so I began sending several weeks of diary each day until I heard from Evan's brother, Eric. That is too much. I can't digest that much information and keep it straight. So that's when I went to sending one week of diary each day. Since 2019, many friends and relatives have asked to receive the diary entries. Currently, I'm sending 57 text messages each day. I also send 52 by email and 11 by Facebook message. Danny sends the diary entries to some of his friends, so more than 100 people 
are receiving the entries each day. We are currently in year 1984 and have 17 more diary years to go. I want to share with you a few of the entries of Mom's diary that I find interesting. Her first diary, her first entry was February, no, I'm sorry, January 1st, 1937. Happy New Year. Prepared a New Year's dinner for my first cousin, Elsie, and Austin Allison. Played cards in the evening. On November the 22nd, 1963, she wrote, John F. Kennedy was assassinated. So I had several programs on TV news. On May 2nd, 1983, Mom wrote about the Kalinga earthquake. Marvin was working at and living at Kalinga at the time by himself. He, his first wife, Eileen, and Marvin had separated. Marvin got off work at 4.30 and drove to the bank teller window and nobody was there. So he rang the bell button and the earthquake began to rock and roll. <laughs> and mom said, I was home alone at the ranch when the worst earthquake shook the whole country at 4.42 p.m. and got to the ranch three minutes later at 4.45. I said, nothing fell here, but Kalinga was devastated. Phone and electric service out. Finally, at 11, Danny got Eileen via telephone and their message and their home is okay. But all her dishes and pantry jars broke. It was terrible. Front walk flew up in the air and turned upside down while Marvin Lee, my grandson, was watching it. They weren't hurt. Marvin worked nonstop at PG&E answering service calls and putting up wires all night the next day and a half. He was a tired guy. Marlene, my daughter, her husband Douglas, or Doug rather, and baby Douglas hauled a load of water to Kalinga and helped Eileen clean up the wreckage. I had so many phone calls and didn't know who they were. Old building places collapsed in Kalinga and some burned. Center of Kalinga is all gone. A few months later, I was riding with Marvin when he drove to the bank teller window. And the voice came over the speaker, don't touch that button, Mr. Daniels. <laughs> After Bob passed away, February, 2002, I received this letter from my relative, Aaron, that to me describes my mother quite well. Aaron wrote. My mom, Norma, gave me your email address. I just want to tell you how saddened I was to hear about your mom's death. I already had my Valentine's card ready to go to her when I heard she was gone. She was one of the few people I know who appreciated my sticker fetish that I put on my envelopes when I mailed her a note. She said she loved stickers too. She was pretty much loved everything. So of course, stickers would be included in her long list of collections. 
What a dear, sweet, loving Pearl she was. No wonder her name was Pearl, because that is what she was to so many, a gem. Her letters were priceless. Ken and I would lie in bed at night after we received the latest newspaper from her, and I would read it aloud. We marveled at her amazing focus on the merriest detail and her vivid imagery. I wrote her many times that she missed her calling in life to be a writer. Her stories of her adventures rivaled Huck Finn and all his antics. Her entire life work focused on the concept of having fun. What a wonderful legacy she leaves behind. That is what comes to mind when I think of Pearl. She just wanted to have fun. She always seemed to instinctively know that fun really was the most important thing, not all the other stuff. She sure made an impression on me, and I intend to follow her example. Signed, Erin Penn. I believe my mom left a great example to all of us in the legacy of her diaries. And now my brother Dan, Danny, is going to share some of his thoughts about Mom's diaries. Good afternoon. I'm Danny Daniels, Carl's oldest son, and I'm happy to be here today with my wife and two boys, Eric and Evan. I mean, Aaron. Evan lives in Washington and couldn't be here. I'm going to tell you a little bit about my mother. Most of her life was spent at the Two R Ranch, east of King City. Here is a photo of her family and album for the 2R Ranch Farm being built in 1915 by my grandparents, Benjamin and Virginia Riss, when my mom was three years old. You'll see the same barn in this picture of our ranch on the left over here. And that barn is still being used Bill has hay in it. Uh, so here's a picture of uh, the. F Here, here's another interesting picture of the Peachtree School in 1922. It's located on our property, a couple of miles from our house. Here's a photo of my mother and schoolmates. And here's another photo of Peachtree School in 1921 when my mom was a student. Both my grandfather and grandmother and great-grandfather and two great-grandmothers attended this school. Here's a photo of my great-grandfather, Henry Rist, and his wife, Ella Mathis Rist. They were married July 3, 1878 at Hernandez. They are shown here with their six adult children. The pictures were taken in front of the Rist house at 504 Lynn Street at the corner of North Russ. It was considered one of the most modern houses of its time, and it was reported in the wrestler that it was, he was prepared to spend $3,000 in 1916 to build it. My grandfather, Benjamin Risk, is the second from the left. In business, he was known as Mr. B.F. Risk. To his family, and friends, he was Ben or Benny. To his nephew and nep and nieces, he was Uncle Benny. And his wife was Aunt Virgie. Uh, 
his daughter, okay, and his daughter, Lilith Pearl Rest, called him Dada all her life. Coincidentally, he was born 144 years ago today. But back to Mom's diary. The first time that I was the subject of my mom's diary was Friday, February 23, 1940. Malaeus' house burned down last night across the intersection from our house. I came to the hospital this evening at 8.30 with more severe pains. And at three minutes after midnight, my baby boy was born. Seven pounds. February 24, 1940. I had a fair night after midnight, and my baby came on Grandpa's 83rd birthday. Sore today when I turn over. Tonight, got flowers from Frank Scolari and Josephine Kane and my mom for the baby, and pot of tulips from the Rebecca Lodge. Let me show you a couple more photos of our family. Here's my mom and dad and me on the lawn in front of the Land Street house. There's me, uh, me on the left and my brother on the right. Here's another photo of us boys. Here's a photo of myself and here I am in the U.S. Army in 1959. And here is my wedding photo of the Community Baptist Church in 1952. That's my mother, Pearl, in the blue dress on the right standing next to my dad, Clarence Daniels. My dad, Clarence Daniels, flew out in western Kansas during a dirt storm, the Dust Bowl in 19. 36, and eventually blew into King City in 1937. His friend who had been in this area a few years earlier had given Clarence my mom's Uncle Willie's address. Clarence and Pearl got married at the Community Baptist Church October the 2nd 1938 on her parents 31st wedding anniversary here's what my what Pearl wrote in her diary on the week of her wedding in 1938 October 16th 1938 we went to church. Earl and Nellie brought us a big fish from a wrecked truck. <laughs> it sure did taste good. Clarence came in. We got more wedding presents. He and I wrapped 160 pieces of cake. October 17, 1938, I made an applesauce cake to decorate for my folks' 31st anniversary. Grandpa set up for a few minutes today. Pressed all my wedding clothes and tried them on. October 18, 1938. Frosted Mama and Dada's anniversary cake. Talked over reception at hall and punch, etc. Went to a lodge meeting tonight. Had 28 of us. They surprised me with a beautiful wedding bride's cake and had bride and groom, bridesmaids, and preacher in dolls just in front. Had ice cream with a pink heart in the center. They got me a bedspread and drapes in yellow of chenille. Beautiful. Grandpa had a bad spell tonight. October 18, 1938, didn't feel good today. Kind of excited. Grandpa is better today, but not good. Teresa came today. We practiced at church tonight. Clarence is staying uptown. Mrs. Morris and Mrs. Hayes are going to help me plan the reception. 
October 20th, 1918, had mama and my hair fixed. Got more pretty gifts. Grandpa seems to be all right over the affair. Our wedding night, I wore a veil and white lace dress, a traveling suit of rust. Showered us with rice. Had a nice reception at the hall. Large crowd. Cut the bride's cake. Went out on Lone Oak Road to ditch the crowd. <laughs> Stopped at the Jeffrey Hotel in Salinas. October 21st, 1938, got up not too early, called Mama, and found everyone all fine. Had our pictures taken at Cook's studio. Drove over to Watsonville and stopped to see Aunt Dorothy and Uncle Roy. Came over to Santa Cruz and got a nice room at the Hotel Palomar. Then went to the show Pioneer Trail and Strange Borders and also a dance review of Little Girls. October 22nd, 1938. Didn't get up early, but this afternoon we went out to Big Trees and enjoyed walking through the trails and purchased some souvenirs and back to Hotel Palomar. Went to a show tonight. Mr. Doodles kicks off with Joe Petter, June Travis, and Richard Lane. And a second show featuring Men are such fools. <laughs> My mom wrote uh, roots go back to her great grandparents, Luke and Mary Riz. And they and their five children came in 1868 in what became Lone Oak. At, as the Children became adults. Henry, Fred, and Julia homesteaded property adjacent to the home place. John got the home place. The other daughter, Abby, married the McIntosh stagecoach driver, Robert Valentine Bosfield, in 1882. Robert named Lone Oak, and became its first postmaster, November 23rd, 1885. In a few months, he left the Lone Oak Post Office to his brother-in-law, John Rest, and Robert Postfield moved Abby and her two children to Indian Valley, where they homesteaded he founded the first Ballotin Post Office on his homestead and became its postmaster February 7th, 1887, six weeks before the King City Post Office was established. Virginia Bell Boatsfield and six more children were born at this homestead. When Virginia was nine years old, she was sent to Lone Oak to live with her Uncle John and Aunt Emma Mathis Rist, who didn't have any children. In 1907, Benjamin Franklin Rist, with his dad, Henry Rist, purchased the Benjamin Franklin Haynes Ranch the two Rist, father and son, created a cattle brand, 2R. In three years, the son Benjamin paid his dad, Henry, and solely owned this ranch. On October the 20th, 1907, Benjamin Franklin Rest and Virginia Bell Bosfield were married. A few weeks before her baby Pearl was expected, my grandmother Virginia went by horse and buggy over the hill and down Sweetwater Canyon to King City to be close to a doctor when her baby 
arrived. She stayed with Henry and Ella Rist, who had moved to King City a couple of years earlier. Mom was born September the 27th, 1912, when Virginia was ready to take her baby Pearl home. Henry had just purchased a automobile and gave Virginia and Pearl their first automobile ride home by the way of Lone Oak Road as it was then, including about four miles up the bottom of the San Lorenzo Creek. My grandmother, Ella Rist, my great-grandmother, Ella Rist, passed away July the 8th, 1934. Shortly after that, my mom decided to move to town and take care of her grandpa, Henry. This she did for 12 years, the rest of her life, the rest of his life. It wasn't long until she joined the Rebecca Lodge after she was in town, which had just begun a year or so later, earlier. Thank you, Danny. sister Marlene and originally we had planned to have Marlene be here and then uh, a family situation came and she needed to be somewhere else so uh, she was nice enough to do an interview with us and so we drove to Parkfield where she lives and interviewed her and so she now she's going to talk to you about her mother so I'm going to go back to the computer and I'm going to punch up a few pictures of um, Marlene as a young girl, and then we're gonna watch uh, the interview with Marlene. I'm Marlene Thomason, Marlene Daniels Thomason, I'm here at Parkfield. Uh, this is where I live now uh, since I've been married for about 52 years. And uh, I'm going to tell you some reflections of my mom and her diary uh, to go in with the theme of our program today. Our mom was an incredible person. Everyone should think their mom was incredible. But our mom was truly incredible. The logging of her daily activities as a parent in her daily entries proves what an involved person she was with her family and her community. Karen asked us each to prepare a brief presentation. A couple of community involvements that wore off on me was 4-H, cooking, and service not only for her family, but to her community. In part, her diary entry, December 2nd, 1952 reads, Catherine de Alvarez stopped by to talk 4-H club. Getting new club started tomorrow night. Then on December 3rd, 1952, tonight, went to Mrs. Watley's to, to, to start new Peachtree 4-H club. Big crowd there, 40 perhaps. Bill Barker from Salinas helped. Barrington's, the Alvarez, Watley's, Chandler's are very interested. Home at 11. This is the first diary entry of many, many entries mentioned 4-H. 
Those entries and dates were so advantageous to us kids when it came to time to, for us to do the dreaded record book. She also kept the King City Rustler papers, at that time called Rustler Herald. The paper included many of the club's social and project activities in its local columns. Those newspaper articles helped build our record books and eventually gave strength to building applications for scholarships and resumes, not only for us, but for others in the community. Although mom was never an official 4-H leader, she made sure we went to events, fairs, work days, fundraisers, field trips from Santa Barbara to UC Davis, even a trip to Disneyland fundraised by the 4-H club through bake sales, dances, and enchilada dinners. With our age difference, there was one year that Danny, Marvin, and I showed lambs at the Salinas Valley Fair together. From her enthusiasm and support, I am now in my 55th year as a 4-H leader after completing nine years of regular 4-H club work and eight years just waiting and wanting to be old enough to be a 4-H member. Back in the Disneyland trip, diary entry, March 24, 1961. Got our suitcases all packed to leave for Disneyland at 3 a.m. Didn't sleep all night. March 25, 1961. Got up at 1.30 a.m. to get to town by 3 a.m to board charter bus for Disneyland. Got to Waikiki Motel at 10.30, then to Disneyland at 11.30. Invited to dinner, 4.30. Had to meet bus, change clothes for supper, chicken supper, $1.95. All day passes, all day passes, $5. She was so excited about the trip that she made herself sick from the excitement. Also, just check out the cost, $5. Today, a one-day pass starts at $96. Thinking about the Salinas Valley Fair, Mom and Dad were very active serving with the Silver Kings and Queens, hosting the various buildings during the fair. Mom made it a point to serve each day at least once so she could get a pass into the fair. After many years of consistently volunteering, Mom and Dad received the Blue Ribbon Award by the directors of the Salinas Valley Fair for their tireless years of volunteer service. Mom didn't enter her handwork, whether knitting or crochet work, or her cooking in the fair until I was married and entering the opening, open division along with me. A couple of her usual fair entries were her no-fail chiffon cake and her divinity. She would even take an extra plate so that the women receiving the entries would have a treat. Several times over the years, she was awarded best of show on those entries. Mom was a terrific cook. She enjoyed fixing food and she enjoyed eating food. She made use of what she had in season. We canned fruits, made jelly and jam, and had an awesome green tomato pickle. We would get lugs of cherries from San Ardo, lugs of apricots from Hollister, peaches from Greenfield, tomatoes picked fresh out of the fields, or carrots from the coal pile at Maggio's processing plant, where Gill's Onions is now. 
Another favorite was cantaloupe by the crate from Coinga. All of those sources are no longer there. The summer of 1960 was one year of a huge canning season. The diary tales of canning plums, apricots, tomatoes, cherries, peaches, making berry jam and pickle relish that summer. Keep in mind, she was feeding a family of six, two being upper age teenage boys in that town. Potlucks were regular food fairs at many meetings, and she attended many meetings. Grange was probably the main potluck holder, but she attended not only Bitterwater Grange number 748 monthly, but would frequently attend Prunedale, San Juan, Marina, San Ardo, and Pomona Granges. Then there was also Rebecca's, usually referred to as Lodge in the diary, which was twice a month, and regional meetings were there too. Mom never just joined an organization. She took an active, active role in attending and usually serving as an officer. She was also active in the church circle meetings through the Community Baptist Church. Mom had many go-to recipes, but liked to try the new ones. Diary entry, October 25th, 1983. Made chiffon cake for tomorrow and Kansas salad. Kansas salad was a, named Kansas salad because she brought the recipe home from our relatives in Kansas. It contained a sunny day pepe, a pasta, which for years was not available in our California grocery stores. So every time we would go out of state, we would bring back a supply of the Sydney de Pepe. Sometimes the relatives from Kansas would mail boxes to replenish the supplies. Christmas time always brought popcorn balls. That recipe was on the back of a Jolly Time popcorn can. Christmas also meant divinity. Recently, I heard the phrase from a published cookbook author and cook, that you have to be in a good mood to make good food. Mom was always, almost always in a good mood. She was an optimist, always dressed in a dress and usually wore a string of pearls. She was a strong, independent and fun loving woman. I'm Karen Jernigan, and I'm going to ask Marlene a couple more questions about uh, Pearl's diary. So Marlene, can you tell us um, about your role in proofreading or helping proofread the diary entries? After Marvin had been sending the diary out for a period of time, uh, he began realizing that some of Mom's writing was a little more difficult to decipher than other writing. Uh, keeping in mind, this was in the day of the fountain pen. And so he would send it to Danny and I, and eventually we would input what information we thought it might be. Uh, Danny has really real good recall. And so now he sends a week at a time each evening and we proofread it and send it back to him and then the next day he sends out that week's information to all the people on the on text the, tree and the email and right right, right. right. Um, okay and then can you tell us um, I just think this is an amazing process that you've gone through and the, it's an amazing effort on your mother's part um, can you tell us what's been the most enjoyable part of uh, being part of transcribing the diary? I think just the reflection of what 
days gone by were, uh, how difficult some situations probably were that she just took head on and went with it. And, um, and I hope that some of the younger generation gets some good information out of how life used to be for us when we were younger. Uh, my own children read the diary and uh, get questions from them every once in a while on, now who is so-and-so? And sometimes I know the answer, sometimes I don't. Mm -hmm. Well, I think it's just um, an amazing process that you've gone through, and I really want to thank you for the role that you've played in that, and I think that uh, people down through the years are really going to appreciate knowing what your mother said. So, thank you very much. Thank you for having me. So we're going to um, conclude our program with a few pictures from scenes from Pearl's life. So I'm going to have Danny come back up and just uh, help us run through these last slides. And so here you go. Okay, that's uh, my great grandfather uh, Henry and Ella. That's at their home on Lynn Street at Russ Street. And that's my grandfather Benjamin and my mama. And here here's the Russ family in a car in 1914. Benjamin, Virginia. Ella and Henry and Pearlie. And there's my mom when she's four years old. And here she is at six, uh, eight years old. And here she is out in the field and they were picking up Barley for uh, onto the wagon, and she's standing on top. Here she is with a gun, the only time she probably ever had a gun. Uh, and she would have been uh, 12. And here she is, 1928. She's about a freshman in high school. And here she is in 31 years she graduated from high school. And here's my mom and dad in 51. And here's my my mom and dad's 50th wedding anniversary, and all of our all, all of our families there. And here's my mom. I had her down in in, in Santa Barbara, and Eric worked in Santa Barbara at the time, and he took us to this restaurant that had this. Thing set up with a surfboard and background, and so he asked his grandma, "Get on there, and I'll take a picture." And that's what he did. She didn't hesitate. And here's their marker here at the King City Cemetery. Thank you, Danny. And you'll see that we have a note at the bottom of that screen. Special thanks to Eric Daniels for scanning historic photos and sharing them with family and friends. So a few years back, um, I think it was Bill Rist handed us a CD, or a, a yeah, DVD, that had a bunch of family pictures from the Rist family. We didn't, or Daniels family, we didn't know who 
most of them were, but we knew they were important to that family. And so now, all these years later, we've heard more of the story of what those pictures were. And many of the pictures that were part of the family collection had names and dates written on them. So as historians, we just want to encourage all of you to do exactly what the Daniels family has done, and that is scan your photos if you've got them, put information that you write on the back of the pictures, because eventually you can piece that all together into an amazing story. So thank you, Eric, for having done that, and we encourage all of you to think about that. So um, we are doing great on time. We want to conclude this program by 3 o'clock. So um, did any of you have any questions? We've maybe got time for one or two questions. And our guests uh, have asked to stay uh, or have offered to stay longer if you want to talk to them. But um, do we have a question from the audience? Um, Sue Ray? Yeah, was Pearl an only child? I don't was Pearl an only child? Danny, you want to answer that? She had a little sister that was born three years before she was, and that little girl lived a little over a year. So essentially, she was a only child. Yeah, she is. I've seen that tombstone. Yeah, that's a historic tombstone. Uh, Bart? I, uh, yeah, I remember when we had the tour in Indian Valley, the Pearl came along, and she knew our. Uh, other uh, diaries in the family. And that's how she knew about uh, a woman who drove 3,000 sheep with her three daughters from San Diego Junction down to Indian Valley. Uh, she knew it was the of course. And uh, she, was, she was there and checked out. Do you remember who kept these other diaries in the family? No, I don't. I don't know who you're talking about. <laughs> Well, one I know of was, but, but there was, was not seen the family was uh, the woman who got the sheep. I, I, her name was uh, Amelia uh, Monroe, and she was born in Chibay uh, a couple times, last month. Speaking of diaries, Marvin, you want to hold up that one diary? Marvin said there's like 13. Here's one of Pearl's diaries. And that represents eight, uh, four, eight, uh, seven, I get it pretty soon, five years. Five years, and, and yeah. And Sharon wants me to uh, to correct the date of her, um, her wedding, which was 1962. Yes, I think we had it right on the screen, but you know, sometimes when you're reading a lot of information, it's easy to to add a decade to you. Did you have a key to that, Marvin? When you uh, and I'd like to just say that the only reason I brought this one diary here is because this is the only diary that I found that didn't have a lot of extra pages stuck in between the pages. Because she had a little, uh, a two by three notebook, and many of those have that two by three page filled in here with maybe 1968 on one side of it and 1962 on the other side of it. And so if they fell out of your book, you're all, they're all day trying to put it back together. <laughs> kind of a mess. Uh, Sherry. The, uh, yeah. That's on the property on the other main side. Sherry, the school, the Peachtree School, is there anything left of that? Oh, okay. In, in 1941 or two, the school was taken to the Kachawa area and between became a 12-year school. Yeah. And a, had a couple cousins that lived over there at the time, and so they knew where it was, and one of them took Marvin and I over there six or eight years ago and we looked for that school but we we weren't successful in finding it. Uh, it we knew it had been moved a few times 
And my cousin, when he was at Fort Ord, had that was in the 1950s, and he had gone back through there and he had found it at that time. It was, but it was a different spot than where he had gone to school in. So Danny, I think you told me that the spot where the Peachtree School was, it's near your ranch. Now there's just some trees left there. Is that correct? Yes, yes. There's uh, some Olympia trees. And uh, they, uh, so anyway, yeah, exactly two miles from our house. So somebody in a historical society told me one time that if you look for those Elanthus trees, also called the tree of heaven, or the black locust trees, you can find historic spots. And that's, yeah, so cool. Anybody else uh, have a question, Kate? Um, the risk came to Peachtree Valley in 1868. Where did they come from? Do you know where they came before? What? Where did they come before they came to Peachtree Valley? Well, okay. They, they started out in Vermont uh, more than 10 years earlier, about 10 years earlier. The oldest boy, John, was born in Vermont. The rest of them were born in Minnesota. They were there about 10 years. Two brothers came there in the first place, uh, Luke's brother and himself, and one brother stayed in, in, in Minnesota, and Luke came to California. Okay, I think that's going to conclude our program, but we're going to have uh, more opportunities to ask questions and talk I think I'm going to call Patricia up to do the um, uh, um, silent, silent auction. auction results. Do you want to come on up? Sure. Well, I can do it from here, I think. Okay, well, let's go ahead then and conclude our program. And if you could say thank you to our, our speakers.